got it. Welcome to Binary Jazz. It's a podcast about things with people and stuff, and that is all. Hi. That's the intro. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So today's topic is um, frameworks, not like development frameworks, but like the ways that companies try to structure themselves to make work happen and why no one has figured out how to actually do that in thousands of years of companies existing. Thousands of years? Companies have existed? I don't know. Probably. I'm not a historian. Well, caveman companies. <laughs> Well, um, it's because capitalism is the pits. Uh, that's the true. end. End of episode. Yeah, <laughs> solved. But, <laughs> but yes, capitalism is the worst. But wouldn't that, like, wouldn't people like, like the we can we can judo capitalism a little, bit, a little bit here because like the the thing capitalism wants is efficiency because efficiency means more profit. So, like, wouldn't the judoing of capitalism be like? Let's actually make a framework that doesn't make everybody miserable so that they just show up and do their job and aren't miserable. I mean, you I'm not so, miserable. But, I, but I guess I, I should disclaimer this, but I'm confused. I mean, in hypothetically, that would make sense. But I feel like a part of capitalism is never taking people's feelings or vibes into consideration it's not it's not a but... fundamental part of capitalism though the fundamental part of capitalism is providing a service or a product for money and and collecting that money and if if it's not necess- it's not adverse to the interest of capitalism to make people happy um but it's just it. not necessarily incentivized <laughs> Yeah. No, I forgot about I forgot about publicly traded companies, and that's the problem. If you're publicly held, then you have a mandate to be successful for a quarter. You don't really care what like turnover is as long as you can hit numbers for that quarter. So it's yeah, that's why it's it's because of it's because of publicly traded companies. Private companies ish are on a longer horizon and and have a a better stick, a better fiscal reason to try and keep employees happy but it's it's not a, it's not effective but they at least have a reason to try whereas publicly traded companies just like who cares like you could be gone we'll just put someone else in your seat as long as the numbers are up each quarter that's the that's the difference all right i'm going to sell all my stock that's scary stock tip sell all your stock <laughs> put the money you had bury it in your backyard doesn't matter anyway <laughs> It's funny you bring up structures because I'm writing a paper right now about like cultural structures and but like having to do with self-identity. And that's what I thought you were mm. going to bring up. And I was like, oh, my God, we're on the same page. I'm like, no, no, no it's just because that's where my brain is. That sounds like, way better. Let's go. Yeah, there. That let's, sounds like let's, a lot more let's fun. talk about that instead. Because <laughs> I realized that my first question was capitalist about, about capitalism. And I do not want to talk about that on a Friday. Oh, I don't uh, want to talk uh, about it on a Monday. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. I, yeah, I, I agreed. get enough of it. Um, so are you like? So is this like buying into the? Um, do you do you remember the the TED talk by Chimamanda? I can't remember her last name. Um, the single story. Okay, well, let me find the link. This is a good one. You can hear me type for a minute. Nope, cannot. Click 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 click. Uh, Chimamanda uh, Ngozi Adichie. The danger of a single story. Well, oh I'll yeah, this I do remember that. Um, that was my introduction to the concept of um, uh, that I can't remember now. So never mind. <laughs> but it's it's a great talk. Like uh, not taking away from that Gary's memory, not taking away from it. Like uh, everyone should check that out. And um, that might be a good uh, a good partial source for my paper. Actually, <laughs> it might help help some of my points. Um, hey, I was helpful on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like the, the I, I, can you can you talk more about like j- the high level of your paper? Yeah, it's basically um, we're kind of tasked with identifying main parts of our identity and how within society and culture it has changed our like 
ethics, perspectives, mm. opinions, how how we will be as future counselors, basically. Um, which is a big topic. And it'll what's different is that like it's radically different for everybody. So like everyone's paper will be very different, I'm imagining. Um, but it's also really interesting to try and also it's like an eight to ten paper, eight to ten page paper double spaced. So like really that's like four or five pages single space. And your identity is like so multifaceted that it's kind of, it's like both easy and difficult to pick out things to be like, I'm going to discuss this and this and this. But then I also need to find peer reviewed sources from the last five years that support my identity, which (laughs) is that about 3000 words ish or more. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, I I can write 3000 words. (laughs) <laughs> I can write 3,000 words, but will it make sense and will, will it, it make have sense and will have a narrative? Yeah. But yeah, but um, like, what are some, like, it's interesting to bring to the table what parts of your identity matter as far as your opinions today. Like, we all have parts of identity, but then there are some that I'm like, well, does that, has that really changed how I feel about anything? I did, uh, getting deeply personal for a moment, I did an exercise recently where I wrote um, an autobiography, um, but from the standpoint of trying to um, identify it as art. And so the exercise was I first just jotted down like snippets to remind me of things I needed to expand on and then capture the color and then identify why I thought of that color with that and what were the relations and uh, playing with colors and uh, complementary and whatever the opposite of complementary is adversarial colors. I don't know what the opposite of complementary colors is. Contrasting. Um, that's the one. Contrasting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you see why I work at the back end. Uh, it's all just black and white, uh, and it turns out it's never black and white. Um, but um, I found that to be. Um, I mean, it was a little um, self. In- well, it was very self indulgent. Obviously, it was my autobiography. Um, I don't know how you could be more self-indulgent than that, Mm -hmm. honestly, (laughs) but, um, I found it to be, uh, but the purpose of it was not to be self-indulgent. The purpose it was to, to determine like how you have arrived at where you are and to recognize, uh, really opportunities for maturity and, and what's, what makes you, yeah. I mean, so not dissimilar, but how I got to this spot, um, significant events, et cetera. And, um, um there's you know it's it's like um so much of the generational stuff that like we have like rears its head in fascinating ways um even after it's a thing we've dealt with Mm -hmm. um and like what that means and what that looks like is um uh easy to unpack in hindsight but in real time it kind of sucks or can i guess maybe that maybe i'm maybe i'm leaning into the darker shades (laughs) i think Uh, but i mean like i mean depending on what it is i think processing something is a lot harder in the moment than when you look back on it because otherwise it's like a survival mechanism otherwise we would never want to unpack anything (laughs) yeah um uh it's interesting timing too so um, last week, uh, we obviously didn't record. I was in Chicago, but the Thursday before was the one year anniversary of Rhonda's mom's death. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I was like, you know, do you want me to skip that? Should I stay, you know, like it's a work thing. Like I can, I can totally not go. And she's like, no, I think it's okay. And I just, I felt, I felt like I made the wrong choice like all day mm-hmm. Thursday of last week. Um, and then Saturday, you know, I came home Friday you know, so Saturday was like family time and uh, the grave markers finally arrived. So we went out and, you know, as a family saw the grave marker and then went to dinner. I mean, for lack of anything else to do, you know, I mean, like, mm-hmm. what do you, fo- how do you, fo- what's, like, what's the appropriate way to follow that up? Like, I don't, I, I don't think my parents and I ever discussed that, uh, <laughs> nor should we have. It's just one of those weird things. Uh, and then Sunday was like the, the one year uh, anniversary of the memorial service. And it's like, you know, I don't know. It's just like, like that timing so shortly after some of this other work I was doing was kind of like a, Oh, 
Yeah. Like it, like, like it, we are in a constant state of flux. It's not past tense in the sense of like long ago, it's past tense is like, I mean, I look at where I was a year ago versus now and I'm like, you know, who was that Gary? And, uh, I, I don't know. I also like, I don't even know where it comes from, but the idea of like, um, like burying the previous, burying the previous versions of yourself. There's, there's a lot of value in that and recognizing that that vehicle served me to this point And I found an opportunity to get into a better vehicle. And, uh, uh, I don't know. That also helps me see that, um, it's not like the trip's not done. Like I'm where I am right now is not, not the completed step and there's going to be another one. And that it's also uh, freeing and fascinating. And I don't know, for me, it's freeing. It's like a, it, it takes, takes a little of the urgency out of everything. So. Mm-hmm. Cause you're just, just like kind of on a ride. Well, uh, yeah, I don't even know if it's necessarily as a passenger. I mean, I can be the driver, but um, also like, like there's a destination for this current leg of the journey. Um, I may, I may know what it is. I may not, I may arrive there and go, oh yeah. And, and then there's a, then there's a different, then there's a different route and the scenery is going to be different and I'm going to learn different things. And, you know, um, they don't, it doesn't have to be a big event that changes the route. You know, it can be little things. And I think that the frequency at which I can improve the vehicle is, um, uh, increasing that frequency is, is the way forward, at least for the the metaphor in my mind that makes it all stick together. Well, that's like a weird deep turn. I was oh, not mind. expecting that. Yeah. This is where I live in the depths. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's fun here. <laughs> it's fun here. I think, it's, well, no, but I think it's always nice to honor past versions of yourself. Cause I think it's really easy to go into like, uh, oh, what did past Allison even know? Like, why yes. did why did she make those decisions? Or, like, it's easy to fall in. At least for me, maybe I'm projecting. It's easy I know for I, me to fall into that place. I have a, I have, I have a habit or had a habit of looking back on past Chris when he was going by Raven, and vilifying him. Mm. a lot um mm. and it's actually been recently through like you know my daughter's 16 my son's 18 they're becoming human beings like fully you know fully functioning adult humans um and with interests similar to mine when i was 16 and 18 um and it's sort of like looking at the things that they're interested in and and reflecting and being like well i was also interested in that thing and here's here's an example of me doing stupid things in in the same vein of of your area of interest um that i have uh come to start to appreciate that uh old chris is not necessarily a villain he just made Mm -hmm. choices that seemed like they made sense at the time and seemed like they worked at the time and has since made different choices and is broadly i mean i don't know arguably a better human i guess (laughs) who knows i um i I love hearing you say that i i struggled with that uh still struggle with that but i struggle with that a lot like like looking at younger gary less mature gary and being like oh boy, that's, that's cringe. (laughs) Like what an idiot. And, (laughs) you know, um, part for me to get to this, like looking back and going, you know, with the data that was available, that was the best that that Gary could do. Yeah. Um, Well, there's a thing that I, um, thing that Aaron taught me when the kids were little, that I had to sort of keep banging into my brain Uh, over and over and over again is that kids do the best that they can with the information that they have and the capabilities that they have at the time. And in fact, everybody generally does the best they can with the tools that they have at the time. And if you like, so you Mm. can't like say, 
oh, bad Gary or bad Chris or bad Allison was a bad person. They were just working with whatever tools they had at the time and responding to inputs and, you know, influences that made sense at the time. And maybe, you know, maybe us at the end of that journey, turning back and like going back in time in a time machine um, or like time traveler's wife could like some somehow influence our earlier selves to like take choose a different path. Maybe we would do that, but like we can't do that. That time travel doesn't exist outside of a theoretical possibility. And so um, like, yeah, it's, it's, and it's also part of the step that brought us here. Like, I don't know who I would be if I didn't have experiences that I Mm, I don't know if regret is the right word, but like would make other choices now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'll remember it differently. <laughs> I'm I'm googling a book title. I um, um I took a few school ex like extra school credits years and years ago, like ten years ago, um, and it never amounted to anything. Like I never got a certificate for it. I never kept going basically. And I was just, and I viewed it as like a failure. I was just like, well, that was mm. kind of oh. stupid. That was a waste. Mm -hmm. That was a waste of time and resources and money. And oh, well, like I guess a learning experience, but whatever. And then like in applying to this program, I got to use those two credits as like my prerequisites. Nice. And I was just like, Yes. <laughs> I was like, I don't have to spend more money going back to school to go back to school. Isn't it? Um, isn't it, it totally how... reframed how I viewed that mm -hmm. year or two chunk where I was taking those classes. And I was just like, it's so silly that I was so mad about them before. <laughs> well, and you adopted this, like the, the world recognition that you did this thing and you didn't use it. So therefore it was wasted, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. now in hindsight, you can go, well, of course it wasn't. But but it wasn't even before you could use them as a prerequisite. It was just that framing that's the the default. Like, you know, if you got yeah, something I mean, out of it, then there was no, you know. Well, and even with school now, it's like people are like, so what are you going to do after you're done? Like, and I'm just like, I don't really know. Like, we're going to see. Yeah. It's that's a problem for three years from now, Allison. Like, <laughs> I um, a key one for me. I don't know why this time is so weird. It's just a year ago. I mean, there's, I don't know. It seems like the, the cycles of intensity and, and the way the brain works for me are, are pretty cyclical annually. Um, we were talking about a year ago about a book I was reading uh, called the Hebrew Bible feminist and intersectional perspectives. I remember that conversation. Um, it's probably yeah. a, a binary jazz episode commemorating that episode. <laughs> yeah. It's like five essays. Um, the introduction is 50% of the book. I don't know how you can call it an introduction. When it's 50% of the book. Like at that <laughs> point, like it's another, it's like the first volume. Um, and the book's only this big. So I don't know how it seemed like a volume. It was really because I had to have a dictionary handy is why. Um, in any case, that dovetailed nicely into um, this like realization that I had of um, just any old texts, like, the Old Testament's easy because it's readily available, but there's all these old texts documenting like people's trying to understand things beyond what can be explained. So, you know, as as science has exploded, um, sometimes actually, um, like like we have we have better explanations, but there's still so much shit that we just are like, I don't know. And uh, and and so there there's that like human desire to to ascribe meaning or purpose or um, something behind it and um, and looking back on that story it's hysterical like when we go like oh yeah the entire earth was flooded haha -ha. or um, I, I have a colleague who I don't remember what the age is but the like the creationist idea that the earth is only x thousand years old is like are you fucking kidding me of course that's wrong I should watch my language with my kids downstairs but are you kidding me like that it doesn't make a lick of sense and there's there's a bazillion examples like that uh and my default was like man people were slash are dumb but that's not that's a that's not a full story right that's like not taking the entirety of context and history and um 
like what's available now people that think the earth is a few thousand years old now are actually dumb so i let me <laughs> throw that asterisk up here um <laughs> But, but it, you know, at the time, like there, there was, there was this concept and it was because we didn't, there was no way to apply that data. So they took the best information they had and that was it. And it's like, I wish there was time travel. Cause I'd love to know in 10,000 years, like what, 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 are, what are the things that we think are, are what's are... that one paragraph about the, the 2000s, you know, like, like it's, it's going to be meaningless in 10,000 years. It's going to be a note, but you know, oh, There's there was a, this, um... uh, there was this empire called the United States of America that popped up for a little while. <laughs> it, it was mostly okay, and then it wasn't cool. All right, like you know, like it's like is that <laughs> it was mostly okay, and then it wasn't. There's a um. So obviously, I I, I watch Critical Role. I mean, that's not obvious, but I, I've talked about it for no. I think uh, it's the, the the length of of this podcast. Um, and so I've been catching up on campaign three and in campaign three. So one of the one of the voice actors that does it, Sam Regal, likes to do various shticks. Um, he's, he's like, I don't know, goofball comedian sort of by nature. And so his character in this campaign is a robot, um, that has been recently awakened and, um, doesn't remember anything about how he was created or built or what he was built for or anything like that. Um, and I think as a joke, um, he decided to make the robot a flat earther. Um, and so anytime it comes up, he goes out of his way to explain how, well, obviously what we are seeing is like the flat earth and, or the flat planet and blah, blah, blah. And there was even a point at which like, they were like either, uh, physically or like astrally, like on one of the, the planet's moons looking down and, and his character is obviously like, oh, well you can see there's the flat disc that, that is, and, um, and again, it goes back to that idea. And I, I, he's really like, he's done it in such a like, I mean, he, he's not doing it like as a satire of flat earthers. He's doing it with, because the other part of the other shtick that he's doing with his character is his character is, it's a, his character is a cleric, but his character is like, he, he specifically had a goal of making his character like a cleric of like uh, therapy. Mm-hmm. So like he's he's like a mental health professional robot <laughs> um, and but he's a flat earther or flat, you know, Exandrian, I guess. Um, and so but he, he approaches the flat the flat earth stuff from the perspective of, well, he's he's never been exposed to any information that is compelling enough to argue the existence of a round planet so of course the only thing that makes sense is that it must be flat and like just finds more evidence to reinforce that oh, belief man. and like if you go down the rabbit hole far enough obviously like you know you can but like it's it's that same idea of like you know like working with the the best uh the best information that that is available at the time <laughs> doing the best with what you've got so mm-hmm. i was talking with some uh, other parents uh the other day and um I don't remember how we were talking about like, you know, teenagers and the, just the, uh, all the growth that's happening in the brain at that point And like mm. what that's just challenging and crazy as hell. Um, and somehow we got on, um, AI and, uh, I was like, well, look, we've got a data problem. Like we haven't solved the input data problem. It's all skewed and biased and, if that's the source, like the AI is also going to reflect that. Mm-hmm. I pointed out like the old, it's not AI, but you remember when Twitter had the issue with like image recognition and mm-hmm. identifying people's faces. And if you put a dark colored, a dark skinned person in a picture, light skinned person, it was always going to take the light skinned person's face. You put a man in and a woman in uh, or someone presenting as a male and female, it's always going to take the male face. And um, I mean, that was a data set problem. And I'm like, you know, nothing's changed. Like the data set is still a problem so what scares me is that um over the next few years we're going to see this kind of trickle into things and it's going to trickle into government in some ways mm-hmm. and we're going to reinforce these broken structures and it's going to be hidden behind rather than learning anything and saying well the algorithm is the problem we're just going to hide behind yet another algorithm and and yeah the only the only way that that when you have a mass of biased data you could fix the data set and make it 
less biased, but then that means manually going through everything to remove bias. Or you can tell the application that sits on top of the data, okay, here are a bunch of conditions and rules that I'm going to give you to normalize or make exceptions for or you know invalidate sections of this vast data set that you have in order to accommodate and in order to uh, counteract bias. Um, and yeah. that's that's all the AI companies are doing at this point. Like the data is already there. The data, like the validity of the data, the 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 origin of the data is is highly suspect. My um, uh, I've actually heard fairly recently that it's relatively widely known in select circles that like much of the data used for the initial like. Um, open AI chat GPT stuff and Facebook stuff was actually from like BitTorrent or like, like BitTorrented, um, like not acquired from any sort of legal means, but like they, they pirated it. And then, but then it doesn't matter because they've got layers of things on top and it's, it goes, it, and it, I, I believe it, whether or not that, that, that claim is true. I believe it because it's that same sort of move fast and break things. We're just playing, we're just experimenting, we're just doing stuff. So it doesn't matter. Like we're not going to end up using this. Oh wait, but we actually now built a product on top of this. Yeah. Just kidding. We actually are using it. Yeah, we're just kidding. We're, we're we're using it now. Well, to that end, like we look at the data, like it's it's it, it's not just recent data that's problematic. I mean, the fact that I can read a book titled Feminist and Intersectional Perspectives on the Hebrew Bible is pretty indicative that this is like a thing we've done a shitty job of solving for thousands of years. <laughs> like it's not it's not gotten a ton better. It's uh um so that being said, like I think that there's 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 foundational issues, and even even applying that knowledge that there's foundational issues, like we even struggle to collectively define what those foundational issues are. Yeah, and moving um, forward, it's always just a matter. It, it's always going to be responding to and reacting to the things that already happened, rather than building a new foundation on which to build something new. God, tear it all down, start again. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, wiser people than I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Um, I got two free trees the other day. Free trees. Free mm -hmm. trees. Yeah. What kind? I, uh, uh, one is a tulip poplar. Um, which has beautifully shaped leaves. It's already starting to head towards like dormancy. So it looks a little ratty, but I'm supposed to keep watering it for the first year every couple days. So I'm doing that. And then the other one is a bald cypress, which I thought cypresses needed like a lot of like, you know, soggy soil, but apparently not. It's it's happy in dryish soil as long as it's watered regularly and, and plenty of sunlight. So um mm. Not far from the enormous oaks that we removed are, yeah, are I was gonna ask two, yeah. I mean, that's exactly why is that yeah. it's like it's been months, but that void is just like, uh, still painful. And so, when this opportunity was available for trees, I'm like, mm, yeah, and I know exactly where they're going. Uh, a little bit further out, they're not in the same footprint, but I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's it, same line of sight from the common spots you'd be seeing them, and both of those. Uh, will probably be problematic for the foundation of the house um, hmm. long after it matters to me. That's yeah, <laughs> that's a problem for someone else. <laughs> that's exact. Yeah, yeah. In eighty years, I think someone else can deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I'm like, uh, I, I, I have to keep these trees. Like, I have to get these ones like rooted and growing because I want that to be like a that pair. You know. I want people to, because they're different species, they're going to grow differently. They're going to look differently. So in 30, 40, 50 years, looking at them, it's going to be like, wow, look at the way those two trees that were the same age have gone. Mm. Uh, I think it's going to be, I'm I'm so excited about that. Um, and like, what a silly thing to be excited about. Like I, who knows if I'll be around to see it, you know? Well, that's kind of the fun in planting trees, no? Like, yeah, I think so. I love that there's a tree in the backyard that's like, you know, probably uh 30 40 years older than the house like like 
I mean, what what did that tree look like when they built this house? Like, oh, to time travel. Like, where were you? Where were you time travel to? Oh, uh, like right Just back the to the tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, yes, I want to. Yes, I want to find all the big trees and go back and see when there are saplings. That's all. That's all I want. You leave a little note for yourself. <laughs> oh, I mean, maybe, maybe that, maybe that is the note for ourselves. Maybe that's like the. Hmm. I I don't know. I obviously this is like the first year we don't have a billion leaves because these oak trees are gone and they just they drop these leaves are about that big and they dropped. 600 bazillion of them ish um but you know i mean I've, of course i was aware of that and got out there in the physicality of raking them but even so like we have trees that are still dropping leaves and that like it's amazing how much mass that is and it they started in the spring and they were naked and these leaves came in as i'm raking them it's just amazing how much even these dead leaves that have dropped everything but the shell like the structural component and the weight that this tree did like was able to like make in half a year and drop on my lawn from just water <laughs> and sunlight. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I just, the- I do kind of picture you underneath this tree, just being like, Hey, with like your rake being like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> I, but I mean, it, but it's like, a, it's just, it's, it's just like what it does. Like it's, you know, and so there's like the accepted like maturity of the tree that that's just normal, but it, how do people walk past trees and not stop and be like, holy shit, this is amazing. <laughs> like it's again, the answer is capitalism. <laughs> and you're I mean, right. I mean, I like, think, if, I like, think what that's would you do if you could do anything? I would just go marvel at trees. That's that thing. That's my answer. I would go appreciate trees. Cause. And but there's, it's, it's a common refrain in our house where Aaron, who is very much aware of like, things in natural environments right like she's the first one to notice the goats climbing on the mountain or the the birds that are migrating or whatever and to for her to to make the observation um like how do people just walk by this stuff and not mm. notice anything because the majority of people will just walk by the stuff and not notice we 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 go there's a there's a trail that goes alongside um it's not really a trail trail it's like a paved trail um along uh the jordan river which kind of weaves through a lot of like our valley and and elsewhere um and um they've done a really good job of like putting this path along most of the jordan river so you can kind of almost go like from like very northern in in the salt lake valley all the way to like very southern salt lake valley it's really cool um anyway so there's a there's a lot of it kind of like goes by like golf courses and stuff. And so there's this one area. So there's like, you've got the river on one side, you've got a golf course on the other side. And we frequently, uh, if we go there at a certain time, we'll see owls. Uh, Mm -hmm. And other times we go there, we'll see foxes, um, particularly at different times of year. And then there's like, uh, like, like, I don't know if they're beavers uh, in, um, or, or no, uh, uh, I don't remember what they're called, but uh, think, like swimmy little guys in the, in the river. Like the kind of like a muskrat kind of vibe? Yeah, muskrats. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we found turtles uh, in the river. Um, and so like we go there and we look for the stuff, right? People will, like run along the thing. There's there's golfers golfing in, in the golf course. Like we've seen skunks uh, along there. And like they're just completely unaware of that. Like there is like this space is teeming with life if you know how to look for it. we see we see uh hawks all the time and like yeah this place is teeming with, with life if you just take half a second to look for it and know what to look and listen for um and yeah people just people just don't I, there there were owls in our our neighborhood at our, at our uh at our old house and we would like uh we found them we would like follow them you know uh, we found them in a tree one time. We were just like sat there uh, staring up at the tree. You could see them through the, you know, it was, it was like sunset. And there's people just walking by, driving by. Like, yeah, people people just are, I don't know. I don't know. We've, the, the, the natural world has lost its magic in favor of television. But do you, but. I feel but like I... some people don't don't take note or don't stop to take note because they know they won't be able to stay in that space or like that mindset like they know that they have Mm. to go back (laughs) so I think some people like avoid it because they're like it's like being like oh I don't want to take a break 
because I have to go back anyway and I'd rather just get this done. <laughs> like that's sad. But this is like a larger <laughs> level, so it's like extra sad. Yeah. <laughs> But like thoughts. <laughs> I, I think about times when I've been rushing, like I need to get this exercise in or I need to like whatever. And I was going to say, I, I don't know if I regret it or not. I don't, I actually don't know if I regret it or not, but I'm certain that I've been in that role where I've, I've not been in that posture of openness. Um, oh, and for mysteries. sure. I definitely have all the time. <laughs> And I don't, I just don't think it's, yeah, I just think it's fair to, to paint everyone with that brush. I feel like we all ebb and flow through that. You know, there's times where maybe that's just like the regular hike. And at some point you become numb to the, the normalcy of it. And it was magical the first 20 times and or a hundred times or one time or whatever. And, and now it's just like a normal walk because I need to get the exercise in. Mm -hmm. And if you were to change that common scenery and put that person in, um, a different trail with different lighting or different time of day or smells or sounds. And it would be that like overwhelming experience of connectedness to like creation around us. I think, I think everybody has that ability, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to, hard to, uh, hard to, to, to categorize people generally as, as missing the point. Thank you for listening to Binary Jazz. If you like this episode, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can visit us online at binaryjazz.us or follow us on Twitter at, at @binaryjazz. Special thanks to Serpiente Negra Ensemble for the use of their tracks for our intro and outro music. You can find them online at serpientenegra.bandcamp.com. Don't forget that you can ask us a question through the forum on the website or on Twitter, and we'll read it aloud on the next episode of Binary Jazz.